I want to welcome everyone to again to another Tuesday. This is our young kids and teenagers class that we're going to have today. And we're actually going to start a little differently than we did last time. We're actually going to start with a song. And you'll see why that is once we get into the song and we'll understand why the things that we do sometimes are, the, are taught by songs. There are times when these songs will teach us a very valuable lesson about the things of God. And so as we begin our young kids and teenagers Bible study, we're going to start with a song. Oh, be careful is the title of this one. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little ears, what you hear. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. There's a father up above looking down in tender love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little feet, where you go. There's a father up above, looking down in tender love. So be careful, little feet, where you go. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Oh, be careful, little mouth, what you say. There's a father up above, looking down in tender love. So be careful, little mouth, what you say. I guess you can understand that song is teaching us about controlling certain parts of our body and not going into areas we don't want to go in. And that's really the theme of our lesson today. Actually, several lessons we'll talk about as we take that song, that very familiar song, and make it into our Bible study theme today. We're going to look at today, oh, be careful little eyes and see how we can use that to glorify God instead of doing what the devil would have us to do. And we're going to look at our first scripture from Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, where Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we want our children to stay as, as much as possible to be innocent and to be pure in heart, even into adult age. I know that the world makes it extremely difficult to do that because eventually we know that the world dominates this world of sin. And we want them as much as we can, though, to stay as long as they can without all the contaminants that the world has to offer the sinful things and the impure things. So how do we keep our heart pure? That's really the basic the idea of the lesson. As we understand, the eyes are the gateway to the mind, or you could actually say the heart. And so what we see affects our life. It, everything that we do in life, if we are seeing, we're interacting with things, and we understand that helps us to know how to do things, by able to see what we're trying to accomplish, what we're trying to, to work with on a regular and daily basis. As we know, there are some people that are afflicted with blindness, not able to see. And you imagine, if you will, not being able to see with your eyes. And I know that's a terrible condition, but we understand we're blessed by, by having good eyesight and be able to see the things and we understand that's a privilege. That's one of the blessings of God in having these kinds of things in our lives. And we try to help those who do not have that. You understand blindness and things like that. We try to help those uh, in that condition as much as we possibly can. But in Proverbs chapter 4, 23 to 27, notice what Solomon said. He said, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and a perverse and per, put perverse lips far from you. 
let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. And previously he had talked about the dark path and getting off on a tangent or off on a bad path from the correct and proper course of life that our parents are to teach us and to how we've been taught right from wrong. If we are a parents that are godly, especially when they teach us about the Bible and, and how God wants us to behave, we are to keep our heart in that perspective in those, those ways, in other words. And because we have to guard or keep, or the New American Standard Bible has the word watch, watching our heart and with, with all diligence. The word diligence simply means being really careful and putting close attention to our heart, making sure that we don't go off into things uh, that are wrong. That's really the point of that song, is to keep our hearts pure by keeping our eyes where they need to be. And verse 25, it talks about looking straight ahead and our eyelids looking right before you. In other words, you don't go off to the right or to the left, as verse 27 speaks of. I think those two verses are connected in that way. The fact that we sin really gets us to deviate from the true and right path that God wants us to live, of purity and rightness and what is correct for us to do in our daily lives. So the heart has a lot to do with that, but also our eyes, as we said, it's the gateway to the mind or our heart. So it will help us so much if, by keeping our heart pure, by keeping our eyes pure, as both of those have a strong connection that needs to be a thought about as we live our daily lives. As young people and teenagers and even adults, all of us need to have that uh, that mindset of trying to keep and watch over our heart by watching over the rest of our hands, our feet, our eyes, and all of the things that we talk about in that song. Oh, be careful as we look at the things our, of our daily lives. And I want to suggest the devil tries to use our eyes against us. That's why you may think, well, why, why do I have to watch over my eyes? Well, later on, young people, especially young kids, I think teenagers have experienced this more than the young kids have. The devil tries to get us to get away from that purity, that state of innocence that we have when we're young, that our parents say, well, stay there as long as you can in that innocence that really is right for them to do so because children are really an example for us to follow a purity because they have to be taught sin. They have to experience sin as they grow up, and, and it's something they do because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We as parents, we long for our kids to stay that way in that state of innocence, and we dread the time when sin becomes a part of their lives because of the devil. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Pay close attention to this. It says, be sober, be vigilant. That goes back to the idea of diligence and being careful and watchful for things that are, are bad to and stay away from them. That's the idea of, of watching so that we can stay away from those things. He says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And you know, young kids may not recognize who the devil is because we can't see him. We can't see the devil. He's not someone wearing uh, red clothes and having horns and a pitchfork and, and wearing red and all the time. That's not the, really the picture of the devil the Bible pictures of. He's someone that we can't see, but yet we know he's there because there's evidence of the fact that he's always there like that roaring lion looking for someone to devour those verse 9 says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And so he's talking to people who, who are suffering because of the hands of the devil and him trying to destroy their lives. That's why we have to resist him. That's the only proper response to what the Bible calls our adversary who wants our destruction. 
And then we have to be mindful of that. That's why we sing that song, oh, be careful, little eyes, little hands, and our feet, and our mouth, and so forth. And we're going to look at each part of that picture of that song as we go through these lessons. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, Here's what John wrote about this. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Young kids, we want our heavenly Father on our side. We want him to love us, and we want to stay in his love. That's why we have to put out the world. And he's not talking about just the flowers and the trees and the hills and mountains and the waters, brooks, and the oceans. He's talking about the sinful part of this world. There are people up to bad things. They're up to no good, in other words. And they're falling into the hands of the devil by promoting sin and terrible things, ugly things, sinful things. And yet he says, for all is in the world, these are the things that they're promoting. The devil promotes by these. He says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So there's the distinction between what God offers us and what the world, the sinful part of this world, and how sin dominates this world. He says it's not of God, it's of, it's of the world, and it's of the devil's area, his, his place of influence. And the world is passing away, is what verse 17 tells us, and the lust of it. In other words, it's not going to be around forever. All the sinful things one day will be, will be out of our lives, out of our existence, even out of our mind. It will not be a part of our lives, in other words. He says, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So that's why, again, going back to why we sing that song, we want to stay in the will of God, what God wants of our lives. He wants a, a life a free from sin and things that only hurt us by all the sinful things that we could do. You know, think about the sins that could hurt us, the drug abuse and things like that, and the, all kinds of wickedness that shortens our lives because we give ourselves over to things we should not do. And I don't want that for any of our young people today to, to live in such a way as that we would uh, cause ourselves pain and misery. But that's what the devil wants. He uses our eyes against us. The devil tries to do that on a regular and daily basis. Going back to the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter three, verses one through six, I wanna read some of these passages. I'll read verses one through six, if you will. So now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. It's talking about the, the devil going into the serpent. So he said to the woman, indeed has God said, you should not eat from any of the tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. So he basically contradicts what God said. He goes against, in other words, he says something different. He lies to Eve, in other words. In verse five says, for, for God knows, here's, here's the Satan, the devil speaking again. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And here in verse six, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Now I want you to imagine just for a moment that Eve couldn't see this, this tree and even this fruit that was on this tree. Could she have very well been tempted by something she couldn't see? So that's how Satan worked. He used something that she could see that was pleasant to the eyes. There was something that she wanted because she could see it's right there. But God had already said, do not eat of this. The day you eat of it, the day you surely will die. And they did die spiritually, but later on they would die physically. That's why we see death in the earth today because what happened in Genesis even affects us today in that way. 
But see how Satan uses our eyes against us by us seeing what we desire and going after what we see with all of our our might, you might say. We, we desire it and we want those things. And we see another example of this in Joshua chapter 7, verses 1 through 21. I'm just going to talk about verses 1 to 20. Here's when the children of Israel had just conquered the, the city of Jericho. In chapter 6, the walls of Jericho fell, and now they were going on to the next country, the little town of Ai. And here the Bible tells us Joshua was leading the Israelites, and they were conquering, but yet here they couldn't conquer this little small town of Ai. Why was that? Because there was sin in the camp. The Bible tells us that man by the name of Achan had done something God said don't do. He had taken from, from the spoils. God said don't take anything from the city of Jericho. But yet Achan didn't listen to that. He took from it and hid it under his tent. That's what the picture on the chart shows us, where he puts these things there under his tent because he saw these things. But eventually he was found out. And the Bible tells us that Moses came and saw all the tribes of Israel before him. And then finally, God showed him exactly where the sin was. It was in the house in the very tent of Achan. And he approaches Achan, and, and in verse 20, talks and says, well, you confess this and give glory to God in this confession. And here's what he says. Achan says, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under. And so they go and find exactly as Achan said, he had took those things and put it under his tent and buried them there. Why did he do that? Because he saw these things. He saw this and he desired it. And it's just like that, that we oftentimes will get into sin and, and to do bad things because we are seeing those things. That's why it's so important, again, to be careful, little eyes, what you see. He should have basically just turned his head and said, you know, I don't want that because God had already said, do not take of any of those treasures, the spoils that were there of the city of Jericho. When those walls fell, they could have took those treasures if God had said to do that. But God said, do not do that. That's what made it a sin for him to do that. And he lost his life because of that very sin. But did you know that Jesus wants us to use our eyes for good? And that's exactly what we can do if we choose to do that. Notice that everything that we see here, that it's a choice. You know, Achan made the wrong choice, just like Eve made the wrong choice. God gives us free will to make choices. In other words, we have the ability to choose, in other words, right from wrong. And here God wants us to choose what's right and good and proper. That's why be careful little eyes, because you're making a decision to say, well, my eyes are only for those things that are good and those things that are right and proper for me to look at and making those kind of choices. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, beginning, says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. As I mentioned, your eyes are the gateway of the soul. That's exactly what Jesus says and simply another way of saying but the lamp of the body is the eye. How you see is through your eyes and everything that you uh, perceive and know oftentimes comes from what you see. He says, if therefore your eye is good, and it's really good because you've chosen for it to be good. You can't simply make that, simply not make that decision and it'd be good. It says your whole body be full of light if you make that decision to have your eye to do what's right and good. But notice what verse 23 says. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And we could talk all day about characters in the Old Testament and New Testament, but that let their, their eyes get away from them and they did bad things. And they let their, their, their desires get out of control because they did not be careful when it comes to what they saw in this life. 
So we have to be very careful in everything we do in, in life and in our eyes and such. Let's make, make good decisions in our lives. That's what it means to make the decision about what you see and in the things that are out there for us to see, like on television and movies and even the things that we do, whatever it is, magazines, all of these things can be a gateway to the soul, either for good or for evil. You can choose good things in your, in your heart and mind because of that. Notice what David said about his choice. And this, again, was David's choice. In Psalm 119, verse 37 and verse 38 says, Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. And so if we choose to fear God, and we are wanting to please and serve him, then we have to turn away from worthless things. That's what David's saying, well, help me in this. Help me to turn away my eyes from worthless things. He made that decision in Psalm 101, verses two through four again. Going back to this theme of the heart and the eyes and the connection that's there. He said, I will behave wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. Now, how do you do that? What well, it takes controlling the things you see around you and, and really making yourself have a good heart in that way of, of doing what's right and living for Jesus. He says in verse three, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. That's how you do that, isn't it? I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. In other words, I'm not gonna fall after people who are doing bad things and, and go down that direction, that road. He says in verse four, a perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. Again, that's a choice. To not know wickedness is a choice. And that's really what it means when he says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. Now he could have done that. And a lot of kings in the time after him, after Solomon, there was some bad kings that did set some wicked things before their eyes. And they made that choice the wrong choice. But yet David was not going to do that. He was going to put right things. And we can do the same today when it comes to making right and proper decisions. Job 31 verse 1, even Job would say about this, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. And here he's making this choice to make a covenant. No, it's agreement. He's not going to with his eyes do things that are wrong in looking lustfully at someone of the opposite sex. And so that, again, that shows us how we can make the right choice, the right decisions in life, especially teenagers. We have to, have to make that covenant with our eyes in that direction. Unless we think this is just an Old Testament problem, again, Paul would talk about in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. He said, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Now, what's this idea of bringing his body into subjection or discipline his body, bringing into subjection? Well, he's talking about the fact that he has to, to be careful. He has to watch over his eyes and his hands and, and his, what he's desiring of his heart. And all of this is connected to discipline and say, well, this is what the body wants. Well, no, I don't have to do that if it's sinful against God. And the world makes it difficult to do this. That's why we have to discipline, be very disciplined. In other words, in, when it comes to what we desire, we have to train ourselves to not want bad things, but to want good things. Why was that, Paul? Because even as a preacher, he could get off into sin and be disqualified and not receive the prize of the, what God says is the, is the heavenly calling of going to heaven and being with Jesus when his life is over. And really the last verse I want to look at is talking about how we can do this. Well, how can you be careful, little eyes, what you see? Again, it goes back to your heart. Choosing, making right decisions about what's right and proper and fitting for us to watch. We don't want to put garbage into our mind. We don't want to put it through our eyes and to see that and to be thinking about that because what you put through your eyes is what you're going to meditate upon. And Paul says, don't do that. Don't let bad things be what you're meditating and thinking about all the time. 
In verse 8 of Philippians 4, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things of, are of good report, if there are, is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. In other words, let your mind dwell there instead of other places. We can, our mind could be in the gutter, but that's not where we want to be. We, our mind wants to be on the right things, not in the pig pen of sin, but on what Jesus wants for our lives, of purity and whatever's of, of good report and virtuous things. Hope you've enjoyed this lesson. We've talked about some things about how to keep our minds pure and keep our heart pure because we understand our eyes play a big role in that very thing. Let's sing one song and we'll conclude with our lesson of today. We'll sing about the wise man. It's one of my favorite songs. The wise man. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down as the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went splat. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessings will come down. Oh, the blessings come down as your prayers go up. The blessings come down as your prayers go up. The blessings come down as your prayers go up. So build your house on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we do that by following God's word. Matthew 7 talks about following the teachings of Jesus. That's how we do exactly that, is by doing what Jesus says, building on his foundation and not a foundation of, of what is wrong, and, but only doing what's right. Hope you've enjoyed this lesson today. I hope it's been beneficial to us. We're going to look at other things we have to be careful in in our next lesson. Until then, have a good day. God bless.